In 1988, the body of a young woman was discovered in an Ohio River under ice. Most of the evidence found at the crime scene, hairs, fibers, and fingerprints had been washed away. But the victim's six-year-old son unwittingly told investigators all they needed to know about the killer. And he did it without saying a word. The clue was in his genes. A troop of Boy Scouts headed to Possum Run Creek one Saturday morning in January of 1988. Their mission was to pick up aluminum cans for a recycling project. In the icy creek in rural Ohio, they spotted what appeared to be a mannequin. They saw something just under the ice um, submerged. It was the body of a young woman. Local police took every possible precaution to preserve trace evidence by wrapping the victim's body in a sheet before taking it to the morgue. A check of missing persons reports identified the woman as 32-year-old Margie Coffey, the single mother of two young children. She had been reported missing 10 days earlier. The police had found her vehicle down off of Park Avenue East by a bar, and she was a missing person by the time uh, this body was located uh, in the, uh, over by the Mohican uh, Park. The autopsy revealed that Margie Coffey had been strangled with her own scarf. The coroner estimated she had been dumped in the creek 10 days earlier, the same day she disappeared. Margie Ramey was her maiden name. She was one of six children who grew up in the heartlands of Ohio on the outskirts of a town named Butler. And she was an outgoing girl, personal. Well, she was a robust girl, and uh, she loved life. She worked on the farm, and then she would uh, help her mother on the farm. Uh, they had a lot of cattle to take care of, and she helped in that. Margie grew up in a loving, religious home. But in her teenage years, as most kids do, she yearned for independence, began spending most of her time in Mansfield, a larger city about 15 miles northwest of Butler. She made friends with an unsavory crowd. She got into some activities that were uh, subject to uh, prosecution by the law. And uh, they were mainly street crimes, that type of thing, that uh, probably were very low level. But uh, that's how we got to be acquainted with her um, during our work on the, on the street. Those street crimes allegedly included prostitution and illegal drug use. Eventually, Margie rejected that life. She met a man named Steve Coffey. The two married and had a daughter, Angie. But the marriage soured, and Margie and Steve divorced. To support herself and her daughter, Margie worked as a waitress. She also enrolled in college to study law enforcement. And during this time, Margie had another child out of wedlock, this time a son, Brandon. Police investigating her murder wondered if Margie had returned to the streets to support her children. Well, I know her family helped her some, but she didn't make a lot of money in going to school. Uh, no, she didn't make a lot of money uh, working in a restaurant. As police knew from experience, life on the streets meant special dangers and a large pool of potential suspects. Get away! Maybe there's somebody in her past that has a reason to want her dead. Maybe she's uh, done something or not paid something. Uh, 
uh, maybe some street person has uh, come to this conclusion that they ought to kill her. With no suspects or leads, police hoped that the rushing water of Possum Run Creek had not washed away evidence which could lead them to Margie's killer. When 32-year-old Margie Coffey was found strangled in a frozen creek, police wondered if her past had finally caught up with her. In her particular case, since she had a background of some activity that was uh, uh, certainly against the law, uh, we, we looked into, uh, into that possibility that she may have slipped back into that uh, uh, drug environment. But friends said that wasn't the case. Margie had been focusing her attention on her family and her education. They were just uh, adamant that they had not seen her, she hadn't been around, and to their knowledge, she had completely cleaned up uh, all of her uh, past activities. Margie was raising, taking care of the children on her own, and she loved her children. She loved them. She really loved them. And I feel that Margie was a good mother. I really do. She had also rediscovered religion. I believe she wanted to be a Christian lady. From all that I could gather from her, she, that's what she was striving for, uh, to, do, to be better, to live better, to act better, and forget all about anything in the past. Police learned that Margie had been actively dating since her divorce. Among the men she was seeing were two Mansfield police officers, both of whom were married. One was Robert Lemon, a veteran of the force. He indicated to us that it had ended sometime before that, uh, probably a year and a half uh, minimum, and that uh, he had not uh, had any contact with her and even spoken to her for any reason. The other was Lieutenant Charles Oswald. He too said his relationship with Margie was over. Lieutenant Oswald was very much in love with his wife, uh, oftentimes spoke about what they did on weekends and things like that. Uh, he was a type of police officer that other police officers, I would say, would try to emulate. Lieutenant Oswald furnished a police report indicating he had been on duty that night on a drug investigation. The trail of Margie's killer was growing cold. We had no fingerprints, we had no weapon, we had to explore the other possibilities, and those possibilities really were going to come from her. Margie Coffey was last seen alive at this diner, sitting in a booth with her school books open, studying for a class. Detective David Messmore interviewed the owner of the diner, who said that Lieutenant Oswald was in the diner the same time as Margie. The two weren't sitting together, but they did acknowledge one another. Are you still tight? How are you? It was a very distressing situation. Uh, not only did I work with him, um, I, I uh, knew he was a, a very good policeman, but I've been friends with him. And uh, it was just. It was very upsetting to me to think that he might have been involved in a crime like that. When confronted with this information, Lieutenant Oswald refused to comment. Margie's parents laid their daughter to rest, an excruciating task few parents are prepared for. Margie's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Ramius, suffered from that day on. There was times that they would just break down and cry uh, when they would see a picture of Margie or when, uh, uh, when Mrs. Ramey would talk to me. Little did police realize that Margie's own son would provide a tantalizing clue, one that would lead them to the killer. As the search for Margie Coffey's killer continued, a Mansfield police officer told homicide investigators about a suspicious incident that occurred the night Margie was killed. The officer said 
he saw Lieutenant Charles Oswald, who had been linked romantically to Margie, on foot, out of uniform, and behaving strangely near the police station. And he had a leather jacket on, which would be unusual at that time of the night due to the fact that he was working. This officer said, what's going on? How are you doing? And, and he kind of ignored him. And he continued on walking into the police department uh, through the back way. Oswald's behavior cast doubt on his claim that he was investigating a drug operation that night. For him to be nervous and excited in that period of time was kind of unusual. That kind of took the luster or the punch out of his alibi. In the forensics lab, Margie Coffey's clothing would soon tell a story of its own. We had a scarf, you had leg warmers, you had a heavy coat. Once the clothing is dry, basically it'll be, it'll be hung on a hanger, just like your clothing would be at home. There'll be a, a piece of paper placed underneath in case anything naturally falls off. And then the article is simply held and scraped with a spatula all the way down to help lift these articles off and let them fall onto the paper to be collected. While most of the trace evidence had been washed away by the water, a very small amount remained. We recovered a number of hairs and fibers, in particular two fibers, red in color. The presence of these two fibers, about a quarter of an inch in length and no more than twice the size of a human hair across, were all we had to really work with. While different fibers may look similar to the naked eye, under a microscope, they are very distinctive. The foreign fibers on Margie's coat and leg warmers were triangular in shape, or trilobal. From the side, this trilobal shape gives the appearance of having a stripe running along the side. Trilobal carpet is usually found in high traffic areas like hotels and automobile interiors since it hides dirt. Tony Tambasco took carpet samples from every location where Margie had been in the days before her murder. Tambasco thought he found what he was looking for in the home of Margie's parents. And at Margie's parents' house, we found a floor mat that actually had red carpet. The red carpet fibers in the floor mat looked very similar to those that we had recovered from the victim. But under a microscope, that carpet was not similar to the fibers on Margie's clothes. Since Lieutenant Oswald was seen in the diner with Margie on the night she disappeared, Tambasco wanted to examine the police cruiser Oswald had been driving that night. Most police vehicles are not carpeted because of heavy use and have rubber flooring instead. But police records revealed that on the night in question, Lieutenant Oswald was the watch commander, and the watch commander's vehicle was different from the others. The unique thing about that particular cruiser, cruiser number 306, was it was a supervisor's car. It wasn't your standard police car that you buy every year with the fleet. It was bought at a public auction. The Mansfield police had gone to an auction and purchased a Chevy Caprice Classic. Um, a full-size car for their commanders. And of course, the upper echelon of the police department have a little nicer vehicle than the, than the guys in the street. The carpet in the watch commander's car was red. Tambasco took a small sample from the vehicle. At first, it looked similar to the carpet in Margie's parents' house. But under a microscope, the fibers told a different story and were similar in all respects to the fibers found on Margie's clothing. We looked at color. You can see the color's the same. We looked at diameter. You can see the diameter is consistent. We looked at the trilobal design, and the pattern does show that. Chemical tests revealed that both sets of fibers had been dyed with the same chemicals. But fiber evidence, unlike DNA or a fingerprint, is not definitive. The presence of the fibers being consistent with the fibers in the vehicle is not an identification to the exclusion of all others. It's not an absolute. There's no way anyone should come to court, or there's no way anyone can come to court and testify that that fiber came from that carpet. It's just not going to happen. But even more damning evidence against Officer Oswald 
would come from Margie's six-year-old son, Brandon. The circumstantial evidence in Margie Coffey's murder all pointed to Lieutenant Charles Oswald. So did the forensic evidence. The two red carpet fibers on Margie's clothing were microscopically similar to the carpet in Oswald's automobile. But the question haunting police was motive. If Oswald murdered Margie Coffey, why did he do it? After Margie had given birth to her second child, Brandon, she told social services that she couldn't identify the baby's father since the pregnancy was the result of a rape. But later, when she applied for financial aid at college, she was required to identify Brandon's father and explain why she wasn't receiving child support. When she became a Jehovah's Witness, and they began to uh, counsel with her, and they found these details out, they said, look, um, you can't lie. You're to tell the truth. And uh, she named uh, uh, Chuck Oswald as the father. With this news, prosecutors asked Oswald to undergo a paternity test. It revealed that the likelihood of Oswald being Brandon's father was greater than 99%. Investigators also discovered that Oswald had refused to pay for child support when Margie asked, possibly because he didn't want his wife to find out about his infidelity. Lieutenant Oswald was married, had children. Um, in fact, up until all of this broke, his wife didn't know anything about Margie Coffey, did not know that he had a child by another woman. And uh, so I'm sure that her finding that out certainly was motive for what happened. Oswald allegedly offered Margie a few thousand dollars from an insurance settlement which Margie refused as insufficient. During Charles Oswald's murder trial, prosecutors presented one more piece of evidence against him. A woman who had once worked for police as a decoy in prostitution investigations, Charlene Dry Sawyer, testified that she too had been having an affair with Oswald. Sawyer claimed that Oswald had not only told her he murdered Margie Coffey, he also provided details of the crime. Sawyer said that after Oswald and Margie saw one another in the diner, they went to Oswald's police car to talk. They discussed the child support matter and Oswald's offer of $3,000 to end the dispute. Take the 3,000 bucks and get out. No, it's not enough. With Margie's refusal, the conversation grew heated and Margie threatened to disclose that Oswald was Brandon's father. I will file a lawsuit and your wife and kids will find out about this. Little slut. Margie slapped him. Oswald responded by strangling her with her own scarf. The forensic evidence reveals that Oswald put Margie's lifeless body in the back seat of his police car, where her coat and leg warmers picked up the tiny red triangular shaped carpet fibers. Later, prosecutors say Oswald drove to the bridge over Possum Run Creek and dumped the body into the water in the mistaken belief that any incriminating evidence would be washed downstream. You know, when it's uh, yellow and it waddles and it quacks, it's probably a duck. And that's the case that we had here. At his trial, Lieutenant Oswald took the stand in his own defense and denied killing Margie Coffey. He repeated his claim that he had been working alone that night on a drug investigation and offered the tight police report to prove it. But prosecutors contended that the report was bogus, implying that Oswald himself had typed the phony report after the murder to give himself an alibi. 
the jury found Lieutenant Charles Oswald guilty of voluntary manslaughter and abusing a corpse. He was sentenced to 10 to 25 years in prison. To this day, Oswald insists he did not kill Margie Coffey. He may deny it, and he may go to the grave denying it. I think, uh, I think he is guilty. Now, if I'm wrong, God forgive me. For residents of Mansfield, the ultimate betrayal is a policeman who commits murder. I mean, it's bad enough to murder someone. But then when you're supposed to be uh, protecting people and then using the office of authority uh, to kill someone, then that's the lowest murder that I can uh, think of. He will never, ever, ever admit that crime. I don't care if they keep him in jail till he dies. He will go to he will go to, to his grave with that in his in his mind. He will never ever. And I really believe that. Prosecutors say that it was solid police work and some luck that helped seal the case. The presence of these red fibers in that carpet was simply a shot in the dark. A police car in our own backyard, a police car in our fleet. The uniqueness of that police car being bought at auction, the chance of that, one in a million. And without the forensic evidence, Lieutenant Oswald might not have been brought to justice. I'd say this was one of the key pieces of evidence, and it would have been more difficult for a jury to have convicted him, if not impossible. <laughs>